Well, that certainly was a, an amazing preview of our concert to come and uh, the whole service. It's just a reminder, especially this last song, that Christmas is all about giving and giving is about giving the gifts that someone wants. Uh, you know, parents are always watching and trying to anticipate what their children really want. And, and if you love someone, you're always, you know, listening and trying to figure out also what they really want. And what's amazing is in this time of giving that God is the one that is, that is really the one we're to be giving our gifts to because he's the love that he already gave. And if we love him, we give something back to him. And, and what's a, a focus for us this morning, in fact, if you want to turn in your Bibles to the book of Luke, we're going to begin this Sunday and then the 8th, the 15th, 22nd, and 29th, looking at the five people that God profiles, that, that God spotlights, whatever word you want to use, that God chose us in his word, gave him gifts that they knew would be a response to loving him. That each of these so loved the Lord, they gave him these gifts. And it's, it's an amazing study, it's, it's I've, especially uh, looking at Mary, giving to God like Mary did. And we're going to be looking at all these characters, how they gave to God. What Mary did is she gave the Lord a series of small little choices in her life that cumulatively sum up a life of consecration. And, and that's what this, this season is all about. What not can we spend? In fact, uh, the news this week, Bloomberg said that, that teenagers collectively have $280 billion they spend every year. Wow, I wish someone were in my house. I'd let them buy the groceries, you know. But uh, <laughs> it, it just was all focused on spending power and who's going to buy this and that. Did you know that, that there are these small, little, mostly unseen by anyone but God choices that Mary and each of the others will look at made that were their gifts to the Lord. So in chapter 1 of Luke and in verse 26, we're going to look at a life focused on giving to God. It, it wasn't just one gift and it wasn't just, yep, I did that and gave it away. It was a life that was focused in every realm of giving to God. And, and really that's this morning, if I could challenge you to anything, it's, it's what you hear. Let this go far beyond. You know, you've heard many people say it's not just Thanksgiving at Thanksgiving, but be thankful all year long. It's not just giving at Christmas. It's a life focused on giving to God all the time. Not just all year long, all day long. It's just part of our desire that we live by. Now think of it, five individuals, and the first one this morning, who did something only God really saw, and with only a few others who barely witnessed it. In other words, most of these deeds we're going to look at, either one person or nobody really saw what they were doing except God. But yet what they did has become a part of what will last forever and ever. You know, that's what's neat. You give a gift to someone this year, you might find it at the Goodwill next year. Believe it or not, we did. We were at the Goodwill, and we found a gift someone in Calvary gave to someone, and those person gave it to the Goodwill because their name was on it, and we remembered that they gave it to them. It was really interesting. There's nothing wrong with that. They obviously didn't need it, and we returned it to the Goodwill too. But uh, the, the thing is that, that all of us never know what happens to our gifts. But you know what? If you give something to God, it lasts forever. And, and that's, that's, the, that's why this is so amazing to look at. What is it that, that matters to God and what is it that lasts forever? And this morning, each of us are also offered the opportunity every day to do things only God really sees and what few others ever get to witness. Remember, those, those gifts that are done in secret, Jesus said in the Sermon on the Mount, are seen by your Father who sees in secret and he'll reward those. And, and that's the makeup of these kinds of offerings, of obedient offerings to God, where we become part of something that lasts forever and ever. And that element of heaven that, that over and over we see is God never forgets. God never forgets what individuals offer to him. God collects our gifts. He never loses them. He never gets rid of them. He never forgets them. And what we offer to God, like these little events we're going to point out today from Luke, are what last endlessly that we can give to God. So basically, we're going to do a little 
biography, the record that God puts down. He records what no one else saw but him, and he puts it all down for us to see, and for us not just to read it as, ha ha, that happened, but for us to see the record of what it is that God received, what it is Mary gave, and what it is that God loved about that offering that she gave. And it's just an amazing way to understand. Well, the first one is in verse 26. And as we look at this incredible woman, and as we read about Mary's life, starting in Luke 1, we find out the ways that Mary loved the Lord and gave herself to him. But what's amazing is, and, and this strikes me before we even read these words, how young she was. I mean, if you just go by, uh, you know, the, the basic books on the background of the first century, Mary had to almost, almost had to be in her teenage years. I mean, they were betrothed very young. They were presented uh, for that year-long wait before the wedding, usually in their mid-teen years, if not before, and were usually married. I mean, if you were 19, you were really old, you know. And uh, there might be something wrong with you if you were 19 and not married yet back then, but they only lived to be 50. Think about that. When the University of Iowa did a dental study of the ossuaries of Israel, they went through all these bone boxes where generations of, of people that were from all the biblical times were stored away in different caves all over Judea and Samaria. When they did the dental exam, they said that the average age of an Israelite in the biblical time the average age was 50. That means that, you know, for everyone that got to be 51, one was 49, and you keep going like that, and you know that, that people died, what we would say, young. And so Mary was very young, probably 16, 17, 18. But what we're looking at, this record, didn't start on that day. That's what's even more fascinating. Let's say she's 17. These had become parts of her life far before she was 17. And they were building in her life, especially the final one that we see, because it would have taken a long time for that to have come to fruition. But basically, the first thing we see is that Mary gave her attention to God. Now, the way we see that in verse 26 is she listened to God's word. You know, you give attention to someone if you listen to them. Now, have you ever seen someone do this? They're in a meeting and they go like this and they go like that and then they go and they go like that. What does that mean? They're not gonna listen to that person. They called, they don't have time for them. They just ended their ability to talk to them. Mary paid attention to God. How do we know that? Because she listened to him. She was willing to listen to, to comprehend, to respond, and that listening to God is seen by her attention that he was able to get. And it's amazing this morning to think the implications that a gift we can give to the Lord right now is to just pay attention to him, just be willing to listen when he talks to us and hear what he says. And if we do that, we're giving the first of these incredible <laughs> gifts that Mary shows us. But let's read about it. Luke chapter 1, starting in verse 26. We're going to read down to verse 28. Let's stand together as we read God's word. Remain standing, I'll pray. And then we'll go in and, and kind of bit by bit extricate all the wonders of what God shows us. Starting in verse 26, Luke 1. Now, in the sixth month, the angel Gabriel was sent by God to a city of Galilee named Nazareth to a virgin betrothed to a man whose name was Joseph of the house of David. The virgin's name was Mary. And having come in, the angel said to her, Rejoice, highly favored one. The Lord is with you. Blessed are you among women. Let's bow for a word of prayer. Father in heaven, I pray that if nothing else this Christmas season, on this first Sunday, as we look at these words that you captured for us of events that no one but you know about today, and you have put them into your forever settled in heaven word, I pray that we would be struck by the fact that Mary paid attention. And when you sent an angel directly from your presence, 
with words directly from you, Mary had a choice to ignore, to refuse, which are basically the same thing, or to pay attention and listen to you. And I pray that we would begin to let into our hearts and minds the reality that you have sent a message to us. And you have spoken directly to us. And you do wait every day, all day long, to see if we'll pay attention to you. And we pay attention when we listen to you. When we stop everything else and every other voice and we just tune in to listen to you. Stir our hearts that if nothing else we give this Christmas season, we would give our attention to you by listening to you speak to us through your word. In the precious name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. You may be seated as you're seated. Every day, every one of us have something in common with Mary. Mary was just like the galaxies of God's servants throughout the centuries. Like Enoch, like Noah, like Abraham, like Job, like David, and like Paul. Mary chose to listen, and we can choose to listen to God. Mary chose to hear God speak. And every one of the great cast of God's servants have all heard and responded to God. That's what made them God's servants. They heard God and they responded. Enoch walked with God. Abraham responded and followed God. I mean, you can just go through. Paul heard the voice of the Lord, was blinded, and, and came to faith in Christ. Some of them heard God directly by hearing his audible voice. Adam heard the voice of God. I mean, God actually talked in the Garden of Eden audibly to Adam. Uh, Enoch also walked and communed with God. Again, he, he heard the Lord. Moses, often the Lord had him write down what he said. Others didn't hear God's voice directly. It was relayed through the audible voice of a prophet. Do you remember when Nathan came to David and said, the Lord said, boom, and he confronted him about his sin. Now, others didn't hear it audibly from God, and they didn't hear an audible prophet talking. They heard it like we do. Now, you know, we don't think about that. Did you know Daniel heard God by reading a 70-year-old letter from Jeremiah, which we have, by the way, in the prophet Jeremiah? And when Daniel read 70-year-old's words of Jeremiah, Daniel took them as God speaking to him directly, and Daniel 9 is him, Daniel, praying to God as if God had said those words directly to him, which he had. And so you and I can be like Daniel and everyone else through the centuries who hear God speak through his word. And that's an amazing thing to think of, giving our attention to God. In fact, every day we can see something amazing. We can see whether we're really listening to God. Now, the way we know we're really listening to God, if you turn from Luke to John 14, Jesus gives us a little test. Jesus said this. Now, his brother, uh, earthly brother, James, amplifies it into one of the most well-known verses in the Bible. Don't merely be hearers of the word, but what? Doers. Why did James say that? Because Jesus said something very important in John 14, 21. And this is what Jesus said. The common element of every servant of God in their life is that they all listen to God speak and then they responded in obedience. Why? Why do we respond in obedience? If it's someone we love, it's because we paid attention to them and heard them and because we love them, we're motivated out of love to respond to them. Now, you know, some people respond out of fear, but the greatest response to God is what it says in John 14, 21. He who has my commandments, my word, my written down revelation of what I desire, my, my will for you, which are my commandments, he that has my commandments, Jesus said in John 14, 21, and keeps them, pays attention, listens, and responds to it. It is he who loves me, and he who loves me will be loved by my Father, and I will love him, and manifest myself to him. Wow. Do you know what that means? Really listening to God 
is built on loving God. You know, if you don't admire, respect, or love someone, you can ignore them. I mean, you, you can just not listen to them, or you can just act like you're listening to them and look at them, but you are intentionally, don't even want to hear what they're saying. But if you love someone, and you know they're talking, you look at them, you pay attention to them, and you hear what they say, and you respond to what they say. And that's what Jesus is saying. If you love me, you'll keep my commands, you'll respond, and I'll love you, and then I'll manifest myself to you. And you see, there's this result of loving the Lord enough to listen to him that he reveals more and more of himself. You ever wonder how people get this deeper, closer, knowing God more and more thing? It doesn't happen overnight. It's a process of hearing his voice, responding to him because we love him. And because we love him, he reveals more to us. And then we respond to that. And then he loves us. And it just boom, boom, boom. And, and actually, God's love doesn't change because he loves us with an everlasting love. We can't make him love us more or less. But every time we respond to him, we experience more of him. Now, the question this Christmas season is, do you love the Lord enough this Christmas to give him the time it takes to listen to him speak? Have you ever been going somewhere and someone wants to talk to you and you have to assess whether or not you have time with what's ahead of you to pause and listen to them? And sometimes we say, I'm sorry, I can't. I've got an appointment. Other times we have that appointment, but the person there is so vital. It's kind of like, again, being in the meeting at where everything's going on. You might even be in charge of it. And you look, and all of a sudden you say, oh, excuse me. This is, and, and it's someone that merits paying attention to them and listening to them. First question, do we have time, the time it takes, to listen to him speak? Secondly, do we love the Lord enough this Christmas to stop and listen to him until we hear what he wants? I mean, it's one thing to say, hi, okay, yeah, it's great to hear you, but they're still talking and we're leaving them. No, if we love them, we listen till we hear what they want. And, and that's why our, we call our reading the Bible our devotions. Do you know why? It's because we're so devoted to the one that's talking that we listen till we hear what they want. And then we respond to it. And we do that because we love them. Another question to think about is, do we love the Lord enough this Christmas to stop, listen, hear, and do what he wants us to do? That's the real challenge of giving our attention to God this Christmas. Really listening to God means loving God. And we need to examine whether we're giving to God because we love him. Giving him what he wants, which is our attention to listen to him. Either we hear God's word as it's just the word of men. It's kind of like the same as the news and the latest here and there. You know, it's kind of all in that, that same level. Or we hear it as it really is, the word of God, which effectively works in us if we'll just respond by faith. Well, Mary, when she listened, joined the many others in scriptures that responded to God. But the next thing we see, if you want to look down at verse 29... The next element is Mary did what I call giving her yes to God. You know, that, that song we sing, today I choose to give my what? Yes to you. That's what Mary does. She gave her yes to God as she bowed to God's grace. And, and what's neat is in verse 29, when she saw him, this angel, she was troubled in Luke 1, at his saying, and considered what manner of greeting this was. In verse 30, the angel said to her, Don't be afraid, Mary, for you have found favor with God. What that means is, just like God with Adam and Eve, God came seeking Adam and Eve and says, Where are you? You know, the first soul winning event in the Bible is, is the example forever. When God saw man in sin, God left the glories of heaven and came down to the garden and walked and looked and found Adam and Eve hiding in their sin. God initiates salvation. Adam and Eve weren't looking for God. You and I were not born looking for God. Nobody looks for God. God looks for us and finds us and calls out to us, where are you? And we respond to him. Mary had been found by the Lord. He came looking for her before this event. 
And sometime early in her life, Mary, the sinner, found her Savior. And in fact, what's amazing about this is, Mary, you have found favor with God, verse 30. Mary partook of God's grace and was saved. Literally, this verse reads, you have been discovered by the grace of God. Like Jonah 2.9 says, salvation is of the Lord. His grace comes looking for us, and we are discovered by his grace. It's an amazing thought to think about Mary getting saved. And her hearing and believing God's word led her to the open arms of God, my Savior. In fact, look over at verse 47 in chapter 1, because in her closing prayer we're going to look at it at the end she says my spirit has rejoiced in god my savior she had found personal salvation now there was national you know god was delivering the nation of israel and did from egypt and that national deliverance was a wonderful picture of the personal deliverance he wanted to bring to each individual and mary had partaken of that. And Mary bowed to God's grace. Mary needed a savior and God the savior found her with his grace in verse 30. She confessed from then on that God had saved her, verse 47. And Mary joined the countless multitudes that will surround the throne of God in heaven. And that's wonderful. And that's another gift we can give the Lord. We can pay attention to him and we can bow before him to his grace and never lose in fact, that's why we have communion. Never lose sight of the fact that at communion, we unworthily look up and say, I can't believe you did this for me. And, and thank him for it. But Mary gave her yes to God, gave her attention to God. But thirdly, look at verse 31. Mary gave up her independence for God. In other words, Mary surrendered to the will of God. Now, if you pay attention to God, if you say yes to him, then you have a choice in life. Are you going to surrender your independence to him? Are you going to surrender doing whatever you want to do because you think it's better than him? In fact, that has to do with tonight. Tonight we're going to have a wonderful Q&A time. And the question is, does God change his mind? In other words, is there, do we have any choices? And, and how does all that work? How do you balance between the omniscience of God and the sovereignty of God and the fact that God says, I respond to prayer? How does that work? A lot of people that are overly under, thinking they understand the doctrine of God just think it's all going to happen anyway. We don't need to worry about that. Uh -uh. God actually within his sovereignty and omniscience responds to prayer. But how does he do that? Right here. When we surrender, when we give up our independence, when we say, I don't want to go my own way, I want to go your way. And so, Lord, this is what I would like to know. I would like to know how I can surrender my way and exchange it for yours and surrender to do your will. That's what Jesus did. He said, I didn't come to do my own will, but the will of him that sent me. And Mary surrendered to God's will. Look how she did it. In verse 31, this angel's talking along and the angel says, behold, you will conceive in your womb and you will bring forth a son and you will call his name Jesus. Do you notice that he didn't say, uh, would you like to do this? Would you like to do that? Mary had already surrendered her independence. She gave her yes to the Lord. She said, whatever your plan is, that's what I want. That's the amazing gift we can still give to the Lord is surrendering. Mary surrendered to produce within her body hands that would someday touch lepers and heal them. She produced a, a mouth within her womb that would speak the very word of God. And to, she felt the kick of feet that would walk the roads of Israel and spread the gospel. What an incredible ministry opportunity. But wait, don't lessen what Mary did. But isn't that the offer that God still gives? How about to women? Remember after Paul categorically without, I mean, there's no dispute. All you have to do is say he didn't, it doesn't mean what it says, but it does say it. He said that the church of Jesus Christ and the homes that are Christian are only to be led by a gender-specific individual, the man. I mean, that's what it says. Now, we have a whole army of people that say it might say that, but it doesn't mean that. Okay, well, great, you know. What other parts of the Bible does it say and it doesn't mean, you know, so you have a real danger there. But right in the same breath, when, when Jesus said, women cannot be pastors, they cannot be elders, and they cannot be the heads of their homes, he follows right on in 1 Timothy 2 by saying, but they will be saved from inferiority 
or second place because they get to be the ones that bear and raise and train the elders, the pastors, you know, the Billy Grahams of this world and the, you know, the, whoever the greatest living servants of the Lord are, they all had a mother. And if that mother was surrendered to the will of God, she will forever have an interest in that. But you say, well, I'm not a mother, you know, well, what about that? Well, think about this. All of us can, can start people's feet towards serving the Lord. All of us can have a mouth to speak for the Lord. All of us can see. In fact, I was just, I met someone out in the lobby you know, one of my hobbies is I love to see who knows who around here. Because, you know, I've spent five years and I, I so far know about seven or eight hundred of the however many people are here. And so I love to go out and I walk up to someone and I say, hey, do you know this person? And both of them look blankly at me. And I thought, you're standing three feet apart, you know, you might want to meet each other. But, you know, and I introduce them to each other. And, and there was someone standing out there this morning, and, and uh, they were standing there, and this other person was standing there. I says, hey, do you know this person? They said, no. I said, well, this is so-and-so's son. And the person looked them over, and they said, really? I said, yeah, this person led them to the Lord two months ago. You see, we, we have the ability to be the mouth and hands and feet of the Lord and speak his word and lead people toward him. And that's what Mary surrendered to. But not to end there, look at verse 34. Mary next gave her body to God. Look at verse 34. Mary experienced God's presence because she gave her body for the Lord to use. And you know what happens? Verse 34 says, and the angel, Mary said to the angel, how will this be since I don't know a man? Verse 35, and the angel answered and said to her, the Holy Spirit is going to come upon you the power of the highest will overshadow you, and therefore also that Holy One who is to be born will be called the Son of God. Wow. Verse 37, for with God nothing is impossible. Now, first think what's going on with Mary. Notice Mary's response. Even after being sought out and given such an amazing message, humble Mary has no airs, no pride, just a humble, troubled heart that anyone would ever want to do such a great thing. Mary knew her own heart. She knew she was nothing and she wasn't worthy to be so blessed by God. But what actually happened? Think about it. I mean, we talk about the virgin birth. What, what actually happened there? When the power of the highest overshadowed Mary, Mary was surrounded by the, the very Shekinah glory of God and God the Son entered her womb. You go, oh. Now think about what happens the instant every one of us gets saved. We become the very habitation, the dwelling place. Jesus existed before Mary ever conceived him. He just moved in to Mary. What a picture of salvation. That we become, Ephesians 3.17, the very place, the dwelling place of God. And so Mary, when, the, the, when she experienced God within, she let her body become God's temple. Now, was Mary then the very first New Testament believer indwelt by Christ? Yes. That's what all of us believers, though, have now. She just became the prototype. All of us are the dwelling place of the very Son of God. Think about that. That Mary experienced God because he came to dwell inside of her, so do we. In the fullest sense, what Phil was quoting, we have the Godhead bodily dwelling in us through Christ. Wow. Mary had him dwelling in her and God did the impossible, verse 37. And that's what our life for him is all about. That's what Mary experienced. And that's what we also can experience as we give ourselves to him. We experience God and we become his temple. And he lives in us. Well, Mary next, look at verse 38, gave something else to the Lord. She not only gave her, her attention and she gave her body to the Lord, she also gives her future to the Lord. And, and look what she does. How do you give your future to the Lord? 
You serve God's plans. Whatever his plans are, you say, that's, that's what I want. And verse 38 captures it. Then Mary said, after this incredible word from the angel and all God's plans, what does Mary say? Behold, the maidservant of the Lord. You know what that would be? At your service. Aye, aye. Whatever you say, that's what I want. See, Mary gave her future to the Lord. I don't think she really understood everything she was in for. I mean, it was kind of exciting having angels talk, you know, and all that went on, and this baby, and, you know, people bringing you gifts from the Orient, and angels singing to you and everything, but it wasn't long before the people started saying, you're the mother of that illegitimate kid. He's demonized. What kind of a woman are you? And, and see, God's plans are not always what we would want, but he knows, as we'll see tonight, the, the, the reality of the eternity of God, that God sees everything equally the same vividly at all times, means that no one is better at planning than God. And Mary served God's plans. And you know how you serve God's plans? You say, I, you don't have to tell me the whole thing. You don't even have to tell me, you know, I, I just will be your maid servant. And, and she surrendered to the Lord. Mary declared she was a slave of God. When you read verse 38, you see the self-description Mary gives. I am the Lord's servant. The NIV puts it this way. May it be to me as you have said. I, and, and she just did it. And you know, that's all the Lord wants. That's a great gift. To say, Lord, I want to serve your plans. What a submissive and godly attitude. She said, yes, Lord, I'll do your will, your way. She said, everything I have is yours, and into the future I give it all to you. And off she goes to be a blessing, starting with her own cousin Elizabeth, who hadn't told her the big news yet. Wow. But keep going down to verse 46, because... Uh, the next thing Mary gives is amazing. I mean, all these things we can give. Mary gives her attention. Mary gives her yes. Mary gives her, her uh, ability to, to have the future under God's control. And she just surrendered all that. But that's not all. Right here in verse 46, Mary also gives her schedule to the Lord. And she says in verse 46, And Mary said, My soul magnifies the Lord. What is this about? Mary fed her soul on God's word. You say, what does that have to do with schedule? Well, do you know how hard it was to even get near the Bible back then? They didn't have Zondervan in the family bookstores and Amazon. You had to, if you wanted to copy the Word of God, either you had to go hear it from a prophet directly back then, or you had to go to a synagogue where they kept it locked in a box, like they still do, or you had to go to a service where it was read a little bit of it at a time. And so there was every barrier to ever really mastering the Bible. It was very hard for a common person like Mary to just have, I mean, the Isaiah scroll is 40 feet long. That's one book, 40 feet long. And that's just one. Was, and they were very expensive. It took weeks, months to copy some of them. But Mary gave her schedule to the Lord she said, my soul magnifies the Lord. And in these 10 verses, if you look all the way down to verse 55, these verses flow from Mary's heart. She didn't, she didn't pull out her digital device and read this stuff. This stuff was written inside of her because she had scheduled somehow time for God to listen to him. And she focused on him. And she points to the Lord. If you read those 10 verses 19 times, she goes, Lord, 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 19 times. You know how many times she mentions herself? Four times. 19 to 4. That's a clear difference. It was all about the Lord. And she did see the impact on her. But it was all about the Lord. She fed her soul with God. And she quotes, by the way, 20 different passages of scripture. Mary gave her attention to the Lord. Now I know this comes from Hannah, but she had to digest Hannah, Hannah's prayer in 1 Samuel 2. And this whole thing shows that Mary 
was willing to feed, she was willing to give her schedule to God. She scheduled in somehow time for God. And, and she's 17 years old. That means sometime when she was 16 and 15 and 14 and 13 and 12, and probably before that, she was doing all this. I mean, she didn't take a crash course to get ready for the angel. She didn't know he was coming. She was building to this point, feeding her soul on the Lord. Basically, it's because she had a life focused on seeking God. And Mary sought God in his word, and so should we. And have you paused to ask yourself, how did she do it? For starters, think how hard it was to have had a Bible study in Mary's day. In the world where Mary lived, women were charged with every drop of water used in the house for cooking, drinking, and anything else was carried home by a woman from a spring or a well in a clay pot. Do you know how long that takes? Five weeks ago, we were sitting by a well that in Nazareth from the old part they excavated that was probably one very similar to the one Mary used. And they have this long rope, and it goes down there in this bag, and it fills up, and you've got to swirl it around so it gets something, and it's leaking, and you're pulling up as fast as you can, and it's dragging along the rock, and more leaks out, and you finally get it, and if you don't do it just right, it's like milk in those plastic bags. You ever had that where it you know, goes all over the place before you can get it where you want it? And she had to do that, and she got the water to the house, and now she had to do it about five more times. And then, beyond the water, every ounce of flour was ground by hand with a stone mill, and every loaf of bread was hand-shaped, baked in an oven that was heated with a constant adding of firewood that she had to find, and every one of the dishes after the meal were washed with even more water she had to carry. I could see her saying, you know, post on Pinterest, don't have time, you know? Tell, give me some ideas, you know? How, how do I do it? But it doesn't... Mary focused her life on God. And you know, most people, whatever they focus on, they get. They'll do anything to get it. And that's what Mary did. Well, what's the conclusion? The conclusion is Mary gave her life to God, and so should we. Mary listened to God's word. When the Lord spoke through his emissary, the angel, she listened. Do we listen when he speaks through the written word of God. She bowed to God's grace. She said yes. She gave her yes to the Lord. She surrendered to God's will. She said, your plans are my plans. That's what I want. Mary gave her body to the Lord. She says, I want to experience you dwelling in me. And she allowed and agreed and served God's plan. She gave him her schedule. And Mary fed her soul God's word. Have you given your attention to God? this Christmas? Have you said yes? How about your independence? Have you surrendered that to him? How about your body? I mean, you know what would be great at this communion? This is the beginning of the Christmas season. At this communion, to have a lot of people saying yes. You're in my schedule. In fact, my schedule is yours. You're, you have my future. I, I'm going to give you my attention. I, I'm going to love you so much that I'm not going to let you be waiting to talk to me all day long and, and let days pile up where I keep hitting the silence button because I don't have time for God. Christmas is a time we give something to the Lord. Give Him your attention, give Him your schedule, give Him your body, give Him your future, give Him your independence. If we will listen to God's word, we'll find those are the gifts he really wants from us today. And just as Mary gave them, so can we by his grace. Let's bow for a word of prayer. As we bow, the elders and deacons are going to prepare to serve us communion. But how about, as you're sitting there, how about deciding what would you like to give to the Lord at this communion? We can, we can give him our time. We can give him our schedule. You can say, Lord, my body is yours, but give him something. And then make this a communion of worshiping the one that's worthy of listening to and responding to. And say, I'm your temple. And I want to live my life like Mary. I want to be your servant. Father in heaven, I thank you for the privilege of gathering today. Thank you for giving us your gift list because you loved what Mary did so much that you have forever recorded those acts seen only by you in your word that is forever settled in heaven. 
You're looking today at each one of our lives. And in all the technology and all the information flying around us, you're saying there's one bit of information that comes from you. And what we do with that information in your written word shows how much we love you, how much we care about giving you our attention. And if we haven't given attention to your word in the last 168 hours, then this morning would be a great time as we prepare for communion to repent of neglect of you, O oh God, and of because we love you, of giving to you our, our schedule and our future and our plans and our body and our attention. Thank you for the bread that you gave your life. And all you ask is that we, because you died for us, that we would no longer live for ourselves, but for you. May that renew or begin in our lives today. In the name of Jesus, we thank you. Amen.